Let's read from God's Word, Genesis 49 and verse 14. Issachar is a scrawny donkey. Lying down among the sheepfolds, when he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. But I just want to explain two things quickly, two words in our text. One, scrawny means strong. This was a reference to a working donkey. Not one on a model show. And then the word sheepfolds can also be translated as campfires or saddlebags. And I'm, I'm ref going to refer many times to the word saddlebags here because it fits what, what happened to Issachar so well. Now we often assign animal characteristics to human behavior, don't we? When life gets hectic, we call it a rat race. When someone is always busy, we call him or her a bee, a busy bee. And then you get the fox who is sly and the snake who is sneaky and the owl who is wise. Now donkeys don't fare so well as owls and bees. We talk of donkey work and we refer to, by using that we refer to undesirable, monotonous work that nobody wants to do. And when, even when it gets to Proverbs, the, the, the Proverbs are not very flattery for donkeys. Here's an Armenian proverb. When they gave the donkey flowers to smell, he ate them. This applies well to um, Zebulun. Uh, to, to, to Judah, who maybe read that he will tether his donkey to a vine. That's the absurdness of that, because you don't do that. <laughs> if you tether a donkey to a vine, you will eat the grapes and the vine and everything. Anyway, there's one. There, there's a French proverb that goes like this. Even the best mule still saves a kick for his master. So, not very flattery for donkeys. There's a, a donkey saying by a writer, um, John Whitmore, that goes like this. The carrot and the stick. Now, you know that well. That's one saying that we have, when you want a donkey to move, just hang a carrot in front of him and he will go for it and so move. Now, this is the saying. The carrot and the stick are pervasive and persuasive motivators. But if you treat people like donkeys, they will perform like donkeys. Now Issachar's carrot was their beautiful and fertile land and their stick two saddlebags weighing them down. The Canaanite strongholds in their allotted area. The tribe of Issachar was a strong tribe willing to work but when they saw how good their resting place was, their carrot, they would even submit to forced labor, their two saddlebags that will weigh them down to continue to reap the benefits of their pleasant land. Hence, the reference by Jacob to Issachar as a scrawny donkey. When we, when we start looking at Issachar, I think we have to begin with the beginning. And that is Issachar B.C., before Canaan. And we will go back right to his birth. Issachar B.C. started already when Jacob was with Uncle Laban in Haran. Now in Genesis 30, we are told that the little boy Reuben discovered rare mandrake plants at harvest time. And he brought them back to his mother, and his mother was Leah. Rachel, her sister, spotted them and immediately pleaded with Leah to give her some of it. Now, Rachel was barren. Leah already had given Jacob four sons. And mandrakes had the reputation of encouraging fertility, which was what Rachel wanted. Now, I've got there an image of uh, mandrake roots, and you can see something strange about it, don't you? It looks like a human figurine. Some of them even look like babies. 
And we think that that's by the reason why the ancients thought that when you eat those roots, it will make you, give you uh, fertility and you will be able to produce babies, become pregnant. Anyway, Rachel wanted some of it because Leah had four babies already and she had none. And at first Leah, her sister, protested and said, no, I'm not going to give you that because you already have everything that I want, which is the attention of my husband and the love of my husband. But Rachel would do anything for what Leah had, children. So she came up with a pr proposal. Jacob can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes, which Leah accepted. Ironically, she got pregnant and not Rachel. She gave birth to a baby boy and she called him Issachar. Genesis 30 verse 17. Issachar because she argued, God has rewarded me. Rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. So the name Issachar has two possible meanings. And most likely the name come from these two words, Ish and Sakar. And it means simply man of hire. This refers to uh, his mother Leah essentially purchasing a husband for a night. The second possibility is that the name comes from Yesh Sakar and it means reward. Or well, there is a reward. And she said, God has revo rewarded me. Now both could apply to the circumstances of Issachar's birth. Next we go to Issachar B.E., before Egypt. Now we don't know anything of his growing up. We don't know much or anything about his teenage years. He is not mentioned by name in the Joseph narrative. Yet the absence of his name from the story of Joseph indicates and implies that he went along with his brothers in the plot to kill and then sell Joseph into slavery. He was one of the brothers originally intent upon killing Joseph. Only Reuben persuaded them later on not to do that. So he was part of that gang who said, let's kill Joseph. What we do know about this era before Egypt with regard to um, uh, Issachar is something written in a book called the Book of Jasher. Information in that book um, is about the, the uh, ancient, is about the, the Israelite heroes and their exploits in battle, and it, it contains collections and ancient songs and poems praising these heroes. It's even mentioned in the Bible, in Joshua, Joshua 10, um, when the Lord stopped the sun in the middle of the day so that the Israelites could win that battle. Um, and it's also mentioned in 2 Samuel 1 verse 18, in a funeral song David composed at the time of Saul and his best friend Jonathan's death. But in Jasher, we read of the sons of Jacob waging war on many of the, many of the Canaanite cities. And they are said to have scaled the walls, each taking a corner of the city by heroic deeds similar to those of superheroes, apparently. But however, Issachar and Naphtali remained under the wall. This is a direct quote from the book remained under the wall. Together they kindled a fire until the iron of the city gates broke, throwing open the gates of the already under attack city. They did not join the fight. The portrayal of Issachar is rather anticlimactic in comparison to the feats of his brothers in this book. From this book we can surmise that he was indeed a clever man a man who made choices to benefit himself and to preserve himself. A man who would take the road of least resistance, the road of least danger, to achieve what is beneficial to him. Sounds like a certain animal, doesn't it? Donkeys do that. When we move and fast forward, to the Exodus, we pick up something else about Issachar, the tribe Issachar. Issachar during the Exodus. They apparently played an important role 
during the Exodus. During Israel's 40 years in the desert, the tabernacle was always situated at the center of the camp, as you can see here. Tabernacle there, the Levites and Moses around it, serving the Lord there. And on each side, there were three tribes camped. That happened at every place where they camped. But the Lord indicated or instructed Moses exactly who should be where, who should camp where. And it's interesting to see that on this side we find Issachar, next to Judah, who were the leaders of that group, and Zebulun. Right next to Judah, a place of honor, a position of honor. And, and that conclusion is even supported in number, number seven, where when the tribes, tribes presented sacrifices in the newly completed tabernacle, we find the tribe of Issachar presenting sacrifices right after Judah, second. So although they were, the, Issachar was the ninth son of Jacob, they were the second tribe to present an offering Again, a position of importance. In Numbers 10, we find the 12 tribes of Israel as they pack up camp and leave Sinai. Now you will see that Judah and Issachar and Zebulon camped here on the eastern side. And when they moved east, they were the first ones to pack up camp. Judah was always the first one to pack up camp. They were the leading tribe. When everybody saw Judah packing up their tents and so on, they would know it's time to move. Right next to Judah was Issachar. And in Numbers 10, after Judah broke up camp, Issachar is listed second. Again, some position of importance. In Numbers 25, we read of a plague that Israel suffered, which claimed about 24,000 lives. And immediately after the plague, God instructed Moses and Aaron to take a census. One of the leaders of Issachar's name is mentioned there. His name is Tola. But Tola is also mentioned in 1 Chronicles 7. And this is what the chronicler wrote about him in 1 Chronicles 7, verse, verses 1 to 5. The sons of Tola were mighty men of valor in their generations. So he was indeed a strong donkey, a scrawny donkey who stood his ground. From, from these 40 years in the desert, we gather that Issachar was a strong tribe. As I said, and as Jacob said, a scrawny donkey. A tribe with mighty men of valor and a tribe with leadership skills. Every time mentioned second when things had to be done or presented or when camp was being packed up. And maybe that was the reason why the Lord gave them the most volatile and dangerous region in Canaan to settle in. Now, first of all, we'll see the beautiful area that the Lord gave them. This is the valley of Jezreel. We'll come to that. But look at how beautiful it is there. It's a very, very fertile area, um, perfectly for agriculture, um, Activity, agricultural activities, but a wonderful and beautiful area to settle in. <coughs> Let's go to the next slide, Sandy. This is where, where they were situated. If we can start here on the left-hand side, right next to Zebulun. There is where Issachar um, was um, allotted a place, an area to settle in. If we go to this side, it is basically we've zoomed into the area of Issachar and this area there corresponds with this red part here. But there are, I, I hope you can see this, there are a few cities names and landmarks that must sound familiar to the avid Bible reader. For example, um, we've got Mount Tabor there. We've got a place called Endor. We've got a place called Mount Moray. 
We've got a place called Shunem. We've got a place called here, yeah, that's a little bit small, Ophrah. And then here at the bottom, we've got a city called Jezreel. What happened there? It's good to know. Mount Tabor, there at the top. Well, Mount Tabor was the site of a battle between the Israelite army under the leadership of Deborah, the judge, and Barak, and a Canaanite king of Hazor. Mount Moray, Mount Moray there. Well, that was the place where the Lord instructed Abraham to build an altar there to commemorate his arrival in the promised land. But it was also at the, at the hill. Mount Moray is, is basically a cropping, a, a, a big hill. Um, it was also there at the foot of Mount Moray that the Midianites and the Amalekites encamped before Gideon attacked them. So that was also the area where Gideon did a lot of fighting. Endor. What king do we associate with Endor? King Saul. That was the place where he went to a witch or a spirit medium to try and access the spirit of, of Samuel for advice. Gross sin. You can read of that in 1 Samuel 28. And, and according to Psalm 83, it was also the scene there at um, Endor, was also the scene of the rout of the Canaanite army under Barak and Deborah, the judges. Then we've got Shunem, also an important place. Shunem. There it is. You will pick up that name from the history of Elisha. Elisha, in 2 Kings 4 and 8, engaged with a Shunammite woman who showed him hospitality, um, who struggled to have children, and then she became pregnant and had a boy. The boy died, and he restored the boy to life again. That whole story of Elisha. And this Shunammite woman happened there in the place called Shunem. Ophrah, not, maybe not so well known, smaller place there on the side. Well, Ophrah was the home of Gideon. And then there's Jezreel. Now you will see Jezreel Valley. You will see a place called Jezreel there. And that valley was called the Valley of Jezreel because of that city. Now this was a very important trade route to the coast and this was also the valley that you've seen in those pictures that I've showed you where a lot of agricultural activities took place. Um, important to note though are these two places Megiddo and Beth Sun. They were Canaanite strongholds and maybe they were the two saddlebags that weighed down Issachar, who was settling right in the middle between them. But Israel's allotment was one of, one of the most desirable of all the tribes of Israel. But as I've mentioned, Megiddo and Beth Sun, it was also the most precarious. Because there were many Canaanite strongholds throughout the area, preventing Issachar from gaining um, control of that va valley. As I've showed you where Megiddo was on the, in the west, and Beth Sun in the east, and the Issacharites, I hope that is the, pr the plural of Issachar, were right there in the middle. This was a very, an area where many battles were fought. Deborah and Barak, I've mentioned them. They fought King Sisera there. Gideon and his 300 men engaged the Midianites in the valley of Jezreel. King Yehu ordered the heads of Ahab, King Ahab's 70 sons, to be placed in heaps at the gate of Jezreel. Jezebel, Ahab's wife, King Queen Jezebel, met her death in Jezreel by being thrown from a window of the palace. There, at Jezreel. And it was there where her body was eaten by dogs. 2 Kings 9. Jezreel was the scene of the phony trial of Naboth and his vineyard, who refused to give his vineyard or sell it to Ahab, and he was killed for that. It was in the valley of Jezreel that the Philistines 
overpowered Saul and his sons in 1 Samuel 31. And even later on, the Egyptians, King Josiah. So what shall we say? It is clear that Issachar settled in a war zone. There was constant conflict there. And Issachar, although they were strong like a donkey, had a heavy load on its back. Pressed in from the sides by foreign forces, the Canaanites, hemmed in by these two cities, who all of them who wanted that trade route and control that trade route, and who wanted that area that was so fertile, and poor Issachar was here in the middle. And sometimes the load just got too heavy for them. And we pick it up, especially during the time of the judges. In Joshua 7, we read that one of, one of these instances where the load just got too heavy for Issachar. They handed certain Canaanite cities in the area over to the tribe of Manasseh. They just couldn't handle the constant conflict with the Canaanites. And perhaps they thought that the tribe of Manasseh would be able to drive the Canaanites out, but they couldn't. The Canaanites were too strong. It, it was only until the time of King David that those two cities were dealt with. Th those strongholds remained threats to the Israelite and Israelites until then. And when the pressure got too much, Issachar even went one step further. They hired themselves out to their pagan neighbors, just as Jacob prophesied in Genesis 49. Verse 15, they will bend their shoulder and become hired laborers. An Old Testament scholar, Nahum Sana, um, wrote the following. Until the final overthrow of the Canaanite city-states in the time of Deborah, Issachar had been content to perform corvi labor. Corvi labor is a day's unpaid labor owed by a vassal to his feudal lord, to his lord. Now for the local overlords, uh, in return for a quiet existence. And again, we see how they pick the road of least resistance. In Jasher, we read how they stormed, how the, his brothers stormed the cities. What did they do? Burned the gates. They gave cities to Manasseh to sort out. And here we read, and there's proof, even extra biblical, biblical proof, that they became laborers of these Canaanites, serving them just to keep the fruit and the pleasure their land had to offer them. Yet all was not doom and gloom for Issachar. They would fight. When it was to their advantage, yes, and they did. Issachar, Issachar's tribe was, was part of the army of Deborah and Barak that I've mentioned a few times, who got rid of those Canaanite kings. And uh, even Deborah even spoke favorably about Issachar. She called them princes, men of honor, in other words. And even one of the judges was from the tribe of Issachar. His name was Tola. In Judges 10, we read, of, we read of him. And he was a judge for 23 years. But see the inconsistency in Issachar. And we also pick it up, especially during Saul and David. And that big clash, all the clashes between Saul and David. The Issacharites were, all, first of all, they, they at the beginning were, were behind Saul. But something Interesting is found in 1 Chronicles 12 during the time of David. This is what we read there in 1 Chronicles 12 verse 32. And of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do, their chiefs were 200 and all their kinsmen were at their command. These guys rallied behind David. Now, tribes in their thousands flocked to David to fight for him against Saul and to overthrow Saul. Issachar sent 200 men. 
Although we read that they were wise men who understood the times, but again you see the pragmatism here in, in Issachar, choosing diplomacy, choosing the easiest road out to suit their needs. They left the fighting for, for the other tribes. And maybe because they were such pragmatic diplomats, maybe that's the reason why we pick up so many inconsistencies in their history. When it seemed fit for them to fight, they joined Deborah. When it seemed fit for them, for them to submit to the Canaanite rulers just to save their beautiful land, they would do that. When it seemed good, they would join Saul. And when they saw that David was getting the upper hand over Saul, they joined David. Which is what we read of here in Chronicles 12, 32. At least um, their decision to join David was, was fruitful because David, when he rose to the throne, defeated the Philistines and he got rid of Issachar's enemies. But about 80 years later, the Israelite kingdom was dissolved upon the death of King Solomon. The northern and southern kingdoms were formed as a result. And Issachar was part of the northern kingdom. <coughs> and from there on, things really went south for them. The first king of the northern kingdom of Israel was Jeroboam. And under his, under his rule, all kinds of idolatry were encouraged and widely practiced. So God sent a prophet to warn Jeroboam. He did not listen. And then God sent a man called Baasha to execute his judgment on Jeroboam. We read of this in 1 Kings 15. Baasha killed Jeroboam took his throne and killed his whole family. Guess from which tribe was Baasha? Issachar. He was the first king from the Issacharites. His son would also become one, Elah. But unfortunately, he too did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of Jeroboam, and in his sin, and later on, his whole house was wiped out as well. Things only got worse from there on. If we fast forward another 200 years, really the whole northern kingdom became mostly absorbed into paganism, idolatry, and the Lord's judgment on that northern kingdom was to send the Assyrian army who destroyed all those northern tribes and took them into captivity. That happened around 720 BC. After the Assyrians attacked the northern tribes of Israel and took them into captivity, those who were still who were alive afterwards took them into captivity, all explicit Biblical references to the tribe ceased. What a sad end. This strong, potentially hardworking donkey laid down, bent his shoulder, and in the end was destroyed. So what can we learn from Issachar? When we, when we think about history, and I, and I understand tonight has been um, a good overview over the history of Issachar. Well, when we think about history, we always ask a question at the end, and that is, well, how should that affect me? What can I learn from it? You know? That's why history is good for us. We, we want to avoid the things done wrong in the past uh, and do the opposite. Do what is right. So what can we learn from Issachar? We can ask the question, what shall we avoid and what shall we do? But there's another part of history that we should, as Christians, that we should 
always remind ourselves of that history is his story it is about Jesus Christ and we should make him the center of what happened and ask ourselves where do I fit into that plan but let's begin with the first question what shall we learn what can we learn well we can look at the history and say ah that looks a lot like my life you know I have ups and downs I fought and I fell there were times when I was strong and was able to say no to temptation there were times I gave in to the load and I compromised the, sometimes my situation overwhelms me so, so you know what I can list, learn this from Issachar maybe I shall take a few cues from Issachar like to be strong and, and carry the load the Lord has given me and to not compromise my faith to not be lazy in serving in the kingdom of God to not choose the easy way out and sleep in on a Sunday morning to not bow the knee to worldly influences and temptations like they did to the Canaanites around them to be wise and mix with the Davids and not the souls of this world all wise decisions all good resolves but we need to see something else here and that pertains to his story there is one part of the history of Issachar that stood out for me and I haven't mentioned it because it happened after most of them were exiled by the Assyrians it happened during the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah about three years later shortly after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel to the Assyrians King Hezekiah did the following please turn with me to 2 Chronicles 30 might be good if we read that for ourselves I'm not going to read the whole chapter just a few verses here and there 2 Chronicles 30 verse 1 2 Chronicles 30 verse 1 now remember all of the northern all of the northern tribes in the northern kingdom they have been taken away into captivity the houses were filled by Assyrians there were new people living there this is what Hezekiah did after he discovered the law of the Lord repented and he wanted the people to to have uh, to celebrate the Passover again. This is what he did. Hezekiah, verse 1, sent word to all Israel and Judah. And also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh. Inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. And then he, gave, he wrote them a beautiful letter that you can read about how he asked them to not follow in the footsteps of their sinful fathers, but to come and worship the Lord during Passover with them. Verse 10. So out went all these couriers with this letter of the king. The couriers went from town to town in Ephraim and Manasseh, as far as Zebulun. <laughs> but people scorned and ridiculed them. They didn't want to. They were so happy with their idolatry. Verse 18. Although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, in the next tribe, Issachar and Zebulun, had not purified themselves. In other words, they, they didn't have that knowledge anymore. They didn't know how to purify themselves for, for, for the Passover. They were so far down into um, away from obeying the Lord, obedience to the law of the Lord and what it all entails that they didn't even know how to purify themselves and prepare themselves for Passover. Yet they ate the Passover, we read in verse 18, contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them saying, May the Lord who is good pardon everyone. Verse 19, take note. Who is this everyone? Everyone who sets their heart on seeking God. 
Everyone who sets their heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Even if they are not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. Verse 20. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Isn't that amazing? That should make us go, wow. Although most of the tribe of Issachar had been exiled, taken captive, and, and they were in Assyria, and they would, from there on just became part of those people. Assyria is the modern day um, Iran. There was a remnant who had set their hearts on God. A remnant who believed God's plan, you see, was not to, wasn't to save national Israel or um, the privileged tribe of Judah from, from whom Jesus would come or even the Issacharites because they had such, such a hard time here on earth, but to prepare a nation, prepare a tribe and prepare a family through whom his son would be born to save those who belong to him, to save those who have and will set their hearts on him in faith to save that remnant that remnant that was his from the beginning those people whom he chose before the beginning of the, of time before he made the earth those ones those are the ones whom he set his eyes on and heart on and his plan of salvation executed for them to bring them to him gave them new hearts so that they will set their hearts on him Paul writes in Romans 9, It is not the children of, by physical descent who are God's children. This was hard for the Jews. But it's the children of the promise. And the promise is Jesus who will come to save a people for himself. Jesus who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. God's purpose and focus in the redemption was on them all the time. Even in the scrawny tribe of Issachar, they were children of the promise. A remnant who were true children of God, who put their faith in God, who set their hearts on seeking God. You know, that gives me hope to preach the gospel. That gives me hope to bring the good news to people. And to preach Christ. Because I know. That it will never fail. Even when Assyrian armies come and destroy whole nations. Whole tribes. God's remnant. Those whom he chose from the beginning of time. To set their hearts on him. Will be saved. And will be eternally safe. In his kingdom. And this is now a question. Where I can ask myself. Am I part of that group? How does that affect me? How does that truth apply to me? Have I set my heart on seeking God? Now that's a. An important question to ponder and think through. A, ponder, a question that we can walk away with in our minds and hearts as we've read and discovered this history of the tribe called Issachar. Thank you for listening. I hope this encourages your hearts gives you hope and makes make you ask whether you are part of that remnant who set their hearts on God on seeking God let us pray together our father in heaven thank you so much for this amazing revelation again from your word just so that we can see that your work is not in vain. That the cross um, of Jesus Christ and, and what He did on the cross, paying for our sins, 
with his life that that is for every one of those whom you have chosen to be yours on those who, whose hearts you, you have changed so that they will seek you and Jesus had paid for their sins so that they can stand before God forgiven clean because of who Jesus was and what he did in their place thank you Lord for that help us to walk in that truth I ask it in the name of Jesus Amen